Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our participants on Martechify today across the globe. Please feel free to put where you're calling in from today in the chat. I do have a few logistics as people are starting to join. We um, are coming in on mute. Um, so if you have questions, comments, please go ahead and put those in the chat during our session today. Also, um, this particular platform does have emojis. So you will see some reactions in the bottom of your screen and you can always send us a clap, a heart, whatever um, meets your desire on that. And then at the end, if we do have time to do some live Q&A, please raise your hand and the host and co-host can unmute you. It is so great to see everybody and um, please do make sure that you follow us on LinkedIn at Martechify and always be checking out martechify.com for new and interesting information on what's going on. Um, Martechify is a community of professionals and um, we are here to learn about all things technology and share with each other. So we have lots of different forms that'll be coming up and we'd love to stay in touch with you. I see we have um, quite a few attendees coming in from New Jersey, the Texas Hill Country, uh, Texas, Dallas, Welcome to everybody. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Um, again, a few logistics for those that are just joining us. Please do use the chat for questions, comments, and um, anything you would like to share with our speakers. And do use the emojis, which is a bit fun. We have claps, thumbs up, smileys, hearts. We love a heart. We even have a turtle, which is fitting for today. So um, you'll be hearing a bit about the turtles with Pizza Hut. So we are excited to have that emoji. Um, do follow us on LinkedIn and check us out at martechify.com. So if we could um, move forward a slide to what Martechify is all about, I'd like to expand a little bit more about the community. But we are um, a community of professionals that um, come from marketing backgrounds, technology backgrounds, all kinds of diverse um, folks out here in the marketing corporate world. Um, we want to talk about tech enabled marketing, making sure that everyone's learning from each other on best practices, success stories, and staying on top of innovations in the marketplace as we are all working on tech stacks and things to boost our marketing efforts. So with that, I'd like to introduce Rich Herbst, the moderator for today's session at Martechify so that he can kick us off. Thank you, everybody. And good morning, everybody. Uh, at least good morning, everybody here into the West and good afternoon to folks uh, on the East. Uh, welcome to Martechify. I think we have an exciting and interesting session teed up today. Um, I'd like to kick off by introducing our expert panelists for the day. Uh, we have Michelle Hagen Slade. Uh, she's a very seasoned marketer, has started agencies, is currently doing consulting and this very senior executive role for Dodge Construction Network. Uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge in uh, basically uh, connected marketing, marketing that reaches across channels uh, and includes a lot of technology. We have Christina Pettison. Uh, who manages promotions uh, at Pizza Hut, and she leads the national major integrated promotions for Pizza Hut. We'll be seeing an example of that today. Um, so uh, she'll she'll be able to speak deeply about the kind of marketing that one is trying to do across channels, and she can go to a lot of depth. And then we have Joyce Schofield, uh, who is head of product and user experience for the Container Store. Deep background in technology, technology products, uh, technology solutions, and uh, also deep expertise in customer experience. So, welcome to our panelists. Excited to have you here and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. Um, and just to launch us, uh, today's focus is connecting online and offline channels, the total experience. Um, and we're bridging from the last session in May, which was MarTech Stacks, fitting the pieces together. Uh, the two subjects go together, you know, when we were mapping MarTech Stacks, how they fit. Uh, last session, you know, a subset of that is connecting channels. So today we're, it's a very related topic. Um, and our discussion will start with framing. We'll kind of map their topic 
we'll identify kind of key high spots. And then from there, we'll move into sharing by our experts around particular use cases and scenarios. Um, uh, each will share for a, a bit about their own work and experience. Uh, we'll process that all together in a dialogue, insights and recommendations, and then a little bit of wrap up at the end. Um, as Laura mentioned, uh, we really want to have the live dialogue. So we'll have uh, the experts and I in a you know, live audio video dialogue, but let's have just as active of a dialogue in the chat channel. So if you haven't done it yet, please open up the chat channel, click the uh, button at the very lower right of your screen so you can see it. And I would invite everybody now to enter something, you know, good morning, welcome. Uh, or if there's something you have on your mind relating to our topic, uh, please, uh, please put it in and we'll be monitoring the chat and Laura will be stirring the pot to uh, moderate the, the chat channel uh, as we go. Um, if you have questions, there will be a section for questions near the end of the session. Uh, but the best thing to do is put your questions in the chat. We'll try to pick it up as we go, as we go along. All right, well, let's dive into it. Um, so, experts, <laughs> good morning again. Um, I've jotted down some typical use cases. You know, what are we solving for when we're connecting online and offline channels? I'll rattle a few of these off very quickly, but things like integrating events with digital communications, integrating store and site visits with digital communications, multi-channel promotions, uh, in, in enhanced engagement during store or site visits, um, enhanced loyalty and retention marketing, delivering a seamless shopping experience, travel experience, financial experience, and then to me, the grand subject of them all, the full life cycle customer journey. Um, love to hear you guys' thoughts. Uh, do these, uh, do these uh, resonate for you? Um, and did, does this trigger any thoughts around additional use cases? And let's go back one slide still. Does it does it uh, trigger any additional thoughts about other use cases? I think these use cases are probably the, they're probably more, but these are the ones that keep coming to the top of the list. And I think it's a bit of the, even taking a few of these and doing them well, is really challenging because we've got more communication channels than we have we've ever had and there's more data than we've ever had and then how do you leverage things like machine learning and ai to take advantage of all that so there's more in the middle but i think these use cases do a good job of covering most of it i think the enablement pieces in the middle just make it i think a lot of marketers are struggling to um, connect the dots because the dots keep proliferating. Yeah, Christina, I see you nodding. Uh, <laughs> you know, the hard work is not coming up with a use case, it's solving it. What are your thoughts? No, I completely agree. And just, I mean, even that last one, the full life cycle customer journey, as we're thinking about our calendar topics from a Pizza Hut perspective, we are really focusing on how we are reaching our consumer across the entire campaign timeline, right? So whether that they get that first hit from a CRM message to seeing a digital ad to seeing our spot uh, from a linear perspective. So trying to understand that full life cycle and you know how those messages all come together. Yeah, agreed. Awesome. Let's roll forward a slide. We've got uh, we've got some of the challenges, um, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, integrating systems and channels, just getting the technology connected in the first place. Activating channels without having seams and conflicts and overlaps. Being able to see the customer in the data, 360 degrees. You know, producing data signals that you can actually work with. I, I don't know too many companies that don't have much data, but I know a lot of companies that struggle with getting clean data that you can actually use to activate. Um, analytics on the back end. How do you synthesize all these data sources and so that you can do the deeper running analytics? And then within that, attribution and kind of optimization analytics around programs and budgets. Um, thoughts, gang. Uh, this is this is a good list. I think underlying this kind of like common challenges is connecting intention 
and brand affinity. Like, you know, when we talk about our customers, we we think of our customers being as being engaged. We would like to know what their um, intentions are or try to predict what their needs are. And we get that from whether it's transactional data or how they engage with us with marketing, but it's such a nebulous problem to solve and kind of nailing down what is the best next engagement, the, next, the best next touch point to put in front of that customer. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm probably okay. jumping in to say very similar things. I think to echo what Joyce is saying, even in the, in, in the section when we talk about the challenges that we're having at DCN, the customer journey involves so many different aspects of the bullets on this slide right now that I think we're going to just have to take a slice of the journey and really go end to end on that one slice as a starting point because it's so easy to be overwhelmed and maybe being feeling overwhelmed is a common challenge that could be like more on the behavioral or just the mindset side of things because internally like if you're tackling a big challenge the whole team has to be aligned to tackling that same challenge and you've got competing priorities and it's really difficult to orchestrate even the internal execution of, of the whole journey, let alone maybe, you know, recommending we will probably just tackle one slice of it because you just get so lost in um, the sea of opportunities and then challenges and mitigation and then, you know, addressing something that's already in market that needs to be optimized or lo and behold, something happens and you're in crisis mode or PR mode or whatever it is. And so it's just a lot to, to, um, to, to address all at once. And so the intentions to complete the journey or to start with the journey, um, I think it's starting point within that journey is also something that needs to be probably more, you know, part of our playbook. Uh, so I think as marketers, we just try to do it all, all the time, and it just gets exhausting. Yeah, and and Rich, you're talking about <clears throat> all of the data that we have. So Pizza Hut is definitely not lacking in that first party data, right? Um, but we've got a new channel that's coming into play for us with aggregators, DoorDash, Uber Eats. How do we maintain that share of voice on those channels? without losing the first party data that we're giving up to these partners. So that's definitely one of the challenges that we're trying to navigate <clears throat> as we roll into 24, um, specifically because one of our biggest competitors is now coming into that space. So um, it's definitely something that is is top of mind um, over here at Pizza Hut. Super good. Let's roll forward a slide. I wanted to list out some of the technologies that may apply. So I've got two slides of these, at least it's as a starter list. So when we think about, you know, how do we connect the data? How do we harmonize the data? How do we get the channels so that they're firing in harm, you know, like, uh, that they're well orchestrated and not conflicting with each other? Off typical tools would include customer data platforms, CDPs, cross-channel campaign platforms, purpose-built CX platforms, customer experience platforms. Um, there's a few of those. Uh, multi-channel communication tools that kind of roll it together for you, journey orchestration tools that are built to reach across pretty much any and all channels. And let's roll forward this slide. Um, uh, Joyce, you mentioned this real-time decisioning. Um, uh, real-time decisioning, next best action, next best experience, next best offer. You know the the, the technology that. You know, processes those decisions in real time. Uh, headless content management systems, headless CMS. Integrated point of sale systems where we have a retail establishment or anything like a cash register on site. Integrated event platforms and then uh, integrated analytics platforms. This is just like the high spots. I mean, there is uh, many, many, many technologies um, uh, and, uh, I think as we kind of get into the expert sharing here, we're going to see some of these pop up and, and get discussed. I think let's move into the, um, um, well, actually, you know, I, I think that, sorry, uh, I think I do have a question. What would you guys say is the hardest, <laughs> the hardest challenge or the, the toughest nut in all of this, uh, out of the things we talked about so far? 
hardest part, um, Rich, is we know when we go, when we reach out to customers, we always assume they're happy to hear from us. We have all these great offers, this great content. We love them. We want them to love us back. And so we always reach out with this sort of like positive lead and, and hope, hope we can hook them, right? Um, but I think some of the, 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 the things that we need to watch out for is always being cognizant of how often we're touching customers. That's where journeys really come into play. Um, how often did you touch them on a particular topic? Is it time to switch your conversation with them if they didn't engage? How do you sense that topic isn't really resonating? Um, and then the last one that I'll touch on a little bit when I talk about what we're doing at the container store is um, our CRM data. What is their sentiment? What's the last touch point look like? The last time we touched them or they touched us, was it positive? Was it negative? Is this a good time to send them an offer email or should I be talking to them about something different? So I think having those data signals available real, real time in a way that you can prioritize everything um, is, is, is really important, especially today where we're just getting bombarded with all kinds of content left and right every, every millisecond, right? So I think that would be the one thing that's top of mind for us is how often we touch customers and when we touch them, where is their headspace with us? Yes. That's a great point. Uh, yeah, a barrage is not the definition of a good total experience, is it? <laughs> right. Totally get that. Other thoughts? <clears throat> I think for us at, at Pizza Hut, we have a challenge of really focusing on what we call sales overnight versus brand over time, right? Everyone has that core memory of when they visited Pizza Hut as a kid. But how do we resonate with this younger, more cultural audience and make us top of mind more of that that share of wallet as they're making that decision, you know, to purchase dinner that night? Um, you know, we have a really great loyalty program called Hut Rewards, but it's we need to figure out how our branded work, similar to what we'll walk through with team with Turtles TMNT, and um, how does that impact our Hut Reward loyalty? How does that impact the brand? How are we able to measure? those types of activations um, against things that are, you know, essentially and long term going to be sales driving. Yes, indeed. Well, super good. Let's get into the sharing. Uh, can we roll forward? Um, and I think uh, Christina is going to lead us off. So, um, yeah, let's let's uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, take it away, Christina. Hey, everyone. My name is Christina Pettison. I lead our national media as well as media partnerships over at Pizza Hut going on a little over six years. Um, a little bit about me. Um, married with three kids all under the age of five. So um, it's a little bit of the Wild West over here, I would say. And I jokingly um, said that this partnership, this uh, this relationship was kind of like my my last child. I, you know, my this TMNT partnership was pretty incredible. But um, our agencies and partners will tell you it was a it was a long road. But we're we're very pleased uh, with how everything came to life. So, you know, want to just kind of quickly talk through the overall program that we executed with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and their new movie Mutant Mayhem that came out this summer. You want to flip to the next slide? I think that, you know, there is an affinity between pizza itself and the Teenage Mutant Turtles. That is undeniable. Everyone knows that. It's part of their day to day. Um, we had partnered with uh, the Turtles in the past. And so when Paramount brought us this opportunity, it was something that we had to jump on. You know, there is just such an IP share between both Pizza Hut and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And what was really exciting about this film is it really hit on multiple different audiences and demographics. So for me and my husband, like we were Turtles fans back in the day, and here we can bring our own children to experience the fun, um, you know, this cultural um, amazingness with uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The hard part about this program is we also had to include our hard hitting sales message for our product, the big New Yorker. So, you know, it definitely is a challenge. And like I was mentioning earlier that branded over time and the sales overnight, how do you bring these two together um, to, to be fully successful? 
Um, and per, you know, what Rich had mentioned before in, in one of the previous slides, this truly was a 360 campaign. I mean, we touched as many different channels as possible. Um, we obviously had touch points within our own, own channels, like our website, um, our uh, CRM platform with emails. Um, we had print and POP on all of our stores. We had custom packaging that consumers and children alike, you can see back here on mine, they love to color and fill in. Um, we did activations at VidCon, a huge, huge, um, similar to Comic-Con, but leaning into like YouTube creators. We did influencer gifting. We did custom Pizza Hut jackets that um, shared the IP with turtles. We created a custom um, AR game where you were tapped as the delivery driver to deliver pizza to the turtles. And if you did, you won amazing prizes like trips to the premiere, pizza for a year. Um, we kicked off the program with a unique PR stunt where we um, delivered pizza underground um, in New York City. We called it underground deliveries where um, you would text a turtle emoji and you would be delivered a big New Yorker right underground. So really leaning into the habitat of uh, the turtles living in the sewers. And then what was really incredible about this campaign is we had a custom animated video spot that lived both on linear and online video. The actual animators from the movie created it. Um, we had the actors doing the voices. So it truly was integrated within the film. The hard part about this is at the same time, we're also trying to sell pizza and sell something at $13.99. So again, it's that arc of understanding what is really the mix of that branded message. How do we become the cool pizza brand and culture, but also making sure that we're hitting those sales metrics. And then finally, these are just some really fun big numbers that I honestly love to share. Um, that PR stunt that we did in New York City garnered almost a, over billion impressions, which is kind of hard to believe, but I love using the word billion. Um, we had incredible social post views from an organic standpoint. We had over almost 40,000 people share parts of the game um, that we did. We had over 1 million gameplay impressions, which when we went into that, we, we really didn't know like what the, you know, what people were going to think about it, how they were going to play. Um, we had plenty of access points to get there, but we just weren't sure of, of how people were going to actually engage. So to see that gameplay was so satisfying for us. Um, we did a ton of experiential. Um, we created fire vans, if you saw the movie, um, that were branded Pizza Hut. Um, so just a, a ton of reach, a ton of engagement. And I think one of the pieces that really resonated the most with me was the support we got from the system. So down to the stores, I mean, they loved it. They were decorating the stores. They were dressing up as turtles. The employees truly, you know, loved the experience. So that's kind of where you've got to think about, yes, we want to sell all the pizza all the time, but what is really going to create, you know, that, um, just true affinity for the brand and even all the way down to the layer of the people working in the store on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a very brief overview, but cowabunga. All right. Yay. <laughs> so question for you, Christina, it seems like what's challenging on this slide is kind of seeing, you know, underneath the numbers, how many people were you able to engage? And, you know, obviously some people are going to be engaging across channels. Some, uh, some people will be seeing media impressions and then ultimately buying. Others won't. So it's like getting underneath the surface. You know, how many people got engaged? How many people were influenced? How many people wound up buying or becoming more loyal? Um, you know, how do you think about that? Yeah, inside and, of you know, as, you know, and this, this session actually tied in really closely with as we're like working through that full wrap report, you know, to share upwards to our leadership. And that is something that we are really trying to identify. It is super challenging. I mean, we did a just simplistically, we did a TikTok top view, which is that first view that you see from a TikTok perspective that had over a 19 million unique reach. You know, it performed 29% over a benchmark from a click through perspective. So it's like, it's how do you add up all of these things together? You know, from a, from a 
hardworking media perspective, you know, we have reach and frequency goals and we hit those goals above and beyond everything from an impression standpoint over delivered when we were looking at all of our digital channels. So you can look at it that way from a delivery standpoint, but yes, to my point earlier, like how do we understand like how much of that really changed the affinity for the brand and how do we know, like, did we gather a new, a new fan of pizza hut, you know, yes. through, through, um, I mean, through that partnership. I would think that you have some technologies and tools that help. Like there is a loyalty oh, program, right? Yep, yep. We've and, got uh, our loyalty program where, you know, we've done some social sentiment, uh, some research that way, um, working through to see like how many new followers we got from a social standpoint, you know, we are working, um, you know, we have, we have uh, worked very closely with our, our MMM partners and we're hoping to get some really, you know, keen data from them in the back half of this year. Um, so yes, I mean, we, you know, through CER, we're able to, you know, we were able to reach some laps customers that we hadn't hit in a while, but yes, to your point, it's like, how can you really get like that one number? You know, I wish it, wish it was a uh, much easier, uh, to get. A lot of organizations are challenged with that for sure. Um, and by the way, uh, the Martechify team is considering a next topic for the next session like this one, which would be integrative and analytics. You know, what are the tools? What are some of the tools and technologies available to pull that kind of a view together and get under the surface? So, yeah, awesome stuff, Christine. A fantastic program. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's pivot around to Michelle. Um, Michelle. Wanna jump in? Hello everyone. I'm Michelle Slade. I'm um most of you probably know me as Michelle Hagan, I've only been a Slade for a couple of years. Um, but have been in marketing and technology and living in that intersection. Um, because I'm a glutton, I guess, but also love the power of it. Um, and really being able to straddle between quant and qual and behavioral and all the, all those things to really improve customer experiences. Ultimately, um, I had an agency as Rich mentioned earlier, um, that I sold a few years ago. And I think I have been trying to figure myself out ever since, um, didn't know if I was going to start another agency. Um, so in the meantime, I've been doing a lot of consulting, um, but have recently landed at Dodge Construction Network, um, which is, um, I think I've been looking for a place to really sink my teeth into. So um, really big opportunity there because of the data. So a little bit about DCN, um, the history there is it's been around since 1891. Um, and sometimes, you know, you really have to think about that, about that date, but, um, Different, a little bit different. Um, I think some people who know me well thought it was uh, peculiar that I would show up in a B2B organization, but DCN, because of the history, um, been around for a long time and commercial construction and construction in general is what, I mean, America, it's the US, we like to build things, infrastructure, power grids, uh, skyscrapers, roads, highways, byways, schools, hospitals. And I just found a very, um, I get very sentimental about it. And I think there's a lot of um, opportunity to really liberate some of the data that we have. Um, so we work with, if you're driving down the highway, you probably um, will recognize companies like Turner, uh, which is one of the largest um, GC or general contractor firms in the country. Caterpillar, Sherman Williams. So we work with a lot of the, um, the uh, building manufacturers um, to do forecasting. And then we also work with the government to inform GDP. So we have a team of economists and data scientists um, who were very active in collecting um, the data about projects across the nation. And they're very well documented. Um, and they're we sell data, so we help inform the forecasting model, the GDP, and now we're getting into the actual construction part of the process, which is when the building actually happens. And Christine, I was thinking, you know, there could be a tie-in like pizza delivery to a job site 
um, is probably not something that um, wouldn't make some sense for some surprise and delight for some of the customers we have. Like once the building is um, project is started and once construction begins, subcontractors are you know busy at work. So I think there's probably a tie in there somewhere. Um, so I mentioned uh, Christina said she likes the billion number even so not to be a one upper, but we've got a trillion data points. <laughs> so it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because we're here talking about how do you how do you leverage data? So for DCN, um, the data is not our challenge. Um, we started back in the 1800s where it was very manual and then went to paper. First publication was in 1913. Um, and obviously have since digitized that, but the challenge we have on the marketing side is that we have not connected it to the communication channels. So that 360 view is like a dream we have. Um, so we have a very um, simple stack right now, which I would say is a single channel, heavy reliance on email um, and email campaigns. But there's an opportunity to work with our customers across an entire um, life cycle of construction from the planning phase all the way through the building phase to give them the data that they need. So, um, as I mentioned, I've only been here a couple months so far, but the first multi-channel campaign we put in market just a few weeks ago, it's already um, generating revenue. So, you know, not that we needed a proof point, but I think probably everyone on this call knows what the power is. If you get the right message at the right time, and to Joyce's point, not be over communicating, you know, in irrelevant ways or just really bad timing. Um, so there is an art to that. So this is um, not that you need to read what's on this slide, but I mentioned we have the data scientists on board who are brilliant and fabulous at these really sophisticated regression models. And this is just a sampling of what this attrition model that they put together and the, the chart on the right, which has all kinds of stuff we're trying to synthesize. But as I mentioned before, there's no connection to a communications platform or CX platform yet. Um, and as we're in the process of documenting the customer journey, as I mentioned before, I think we could easily get overwhelmed, not just because we have so much data, but because our customer journey is so long. So the planning of a commercial construction project starts years in advance, and then the project gets started. And then the, I mean, how many highways have we seen? I know in Texas that last for years. Um, when are they going to be done? So our journey spans a long period of time um, and so that data being relevant, like you might need some dumpsters at you know, a certain point in time or demolition, or you might need the pizza, or you might need um, all kinds of things across that journey. So I think we've got our work cut out for us. Um, I think we're going to start as simply as we can so that we don't get overwhelmed um, and then go from there. Good stuff. Question for you, Michelle. So, um, you know, I'm, you know, trillion, three trillion data records, long customer journey that just, you know, immediately shows up as a hairy, hairy challenge in terms of how, how do you do something with all of that? Where's the largest challenge here? Is it actually kind of uh, creating the customer experience and executing it? Or is it get the data in the first place so that you can even get started? I think we... So we have the data living in these models that have not been, like you can't action them yet. Right. So for us, I think going along the journey, I think understanding where our customers are in the, where is their particular need? Like where are they experiencing the greatest amount of pain? Yes. Which I believe is directly correlated to how much data they're trying to consume. So we have all these dashboards and information and, and when you think about what where they are, not just in any moment of time, but they're on the move, just like you know the other um, panelists we have talking about their customers and where they are in the physical journey. So they might be at a job site and they're outside. How do I get them the information about? Hey, here's some you know some concrete, or um, you know they're trying to get more hands um, to the job site. 
you know, and they need it within 24 hours. Like, how do we help them do that effectively? So, so it's I not the I, data, it's data accessible for activation. I see that in the chat and I was having the same thought. So, which implies yeah. uh, maybe a different kind of data platform. Is that, is that, um, you know, do you have thoughts around what kind of, you know, where, where this new stack that you're building might start? Yeah, we're since we're I'm relatively new, so just a couple months in, I think there's still more discovery to be had. Um, so I think once we really understand where those largest pain points are and we can get into what, you know, what slice of the journey and what does the data activation look like, then we can get into the dependencies and interdependencies. And I think we're um, so I don't know. I think it's, you know, it's a it's something we're gonna have to to identify um, right. in short order. In work. Yep. At least we're starting from scratch, which I would say from experience of we don't have a lot of technical debt in from a MarTech perspective, because we have nothing. So gotcha. um, we're starting from uh, ground zero, but we have tons of data. So it's- um, Got it. Got that Got it. So yeah, some stack architecture ahead. And uh, it sounds like it's still early in the journey for that, but- um, I think the challenge is certainly very clear. Well, thank you. Um, let's roll around to Joyce. Um, Joyce, would you like to kick off? Yeah, thank you. Um, so just picking up on your wonderful intro. So I'm Joyce Schofield. Um, I've been in this space for the technology space for 23 plus years, led a uh, product in various forms and fashion for 17 years, love being product, love being um, in spaces where I can touch and address customer experience. So at the container store, I lead a product across all things technology. If you can imagine, so that's digital, web.com, marketing stores, merchandising, supply chain, logistics, finance, and our custom space um, area as well. Um, I think as, as a, before we get into the case studies, I think I'd like to maybe share a background about container store, because I know we have fans out there, but just in case, um, this is our mission. We exist to transform lives through the power of organization. If you've ever gone through that uh, experience of having a space that was completely chaotic um, and put in a design or an organization system, it's so liberating. Um, and that's what we do. We, we bring that delightful experience to our customers. Um, moving to the next slide. We have one thing that works really well for us and we're ha happy about it and also humble about it. Customers love us. Some of the phrases that you will hear customers say when, uh, when I mention I work at the container store, um, I hear this phrase over and over again. Oh, I love the container store. That's my happy place. I can spend hours in that store. Um, and so we, we have this brand affinity and customer love that's really working for us. Um, but our business is two parts. One is general merchandising, and then the other piece is custom spaces. Um, I see some love. So if, if you are one of those happy, container store is my happy place, please put a chat or emoji in the chat so I know who you are. Um, um, so general merchandising. So the way we think about our brand is we are a lifestyle, lifetime brand, right? So we think of us as we can solve any organization problem that you have, whether it's the actual space, building a system for you, giving you tools and solutions to make your space work better for you, more efficient, and even making your space look beautiful, clean. So from one end to the other, we can solve that. And so that's our general merchandising catalog. On the other side, we have the custom space business where we can build out any, any design, any space that you need to be built out. We have three brands, main brands. We have Avera and Alpha, that's our modular brand. And then Preston is our 100% wood product. We design it for you, for your space. It's sent to our, uh, our um, factory in Chicago. It's cut, delivered, and installed at your home. It's just for your space. So we can solve from modular systems all the way to high-end custom systems. Um, and so that's why we think of ourselves as a lifestyle and lifetime brand, because we really do see these spaces living in a customer's home for the life that they're living in that home. Um, 
but to enable this, if you go to the next slide, you know, having the right technology is critical. Over the last year, we've made some really good progress um, with some significant investment in leveling up some of the technology that's helping us solve for the seamless experience. So you'll see here where we're actually in the process of implementing Salesforce Marketing Cloud, which I am super excited about. Tori Mapp, who's our VP of Loyalty, is super excited about because we can finally do this dreamy thing we've been talking about, which is journey mapping. Um, we are also leveling up or upgrading our Epsilon CDP, our customer data profile uh, platform. We were using an older version. We're now going to the new cloud solution. Again, just new technology is going to help us teach all of this together. Um, something else that we're doing on the front end is leaning into the Prismic solution that we use today. They have a new platform that's going to enable headless CMS, and I'll touch on why that's important. Um, and then a year ago, we launched our, I would say we rebranded and relaunched our new loyalty program, Organized Insider. Um, so all of this um, investments and capabilities, what's putting us in this space where we are going into where we feel pretty confident in being able to execute some of these dreamy things, 360 degrees, customer journey, and so forth. Um, so I have three use cases I want to walk through with you. And um, if you've done something similar, put it in the chat. If you have any questions, put it in the chat. So the first use case is how do we bring kind of like this inspiring and engaging storytelling online? The way we think about our customer touch points, we actually want to drive our customers to come and see us in the store. Every single one of our customers, we would love them to at least visit their local container store once in a while. We, we do this because we know that the excitement that they get, the engagement that they get, the possibilities that they uncover are endless. And we know that we can turn that around and turn that into a, a, a loyal customer. So we look, we're looking for ways to bring that storytelling online. It's easier to do in the store. Um, we actually are launching what I'll, what I'll say is our new brand expression in our stores. We have a new store concept that we are testing and we're putting these expressions in the store and we're seeing customers really engage really well with them. As an example, we have an entertainment kind of like brand expression where you can see an actual space built out. You can imagine this is your in-home entertainment unit. Um, you can see all the entertainment solution in there. You can see how to make it beautiful. You can see how you can have this sort of like entertainment solution and from start to finish in your home, you see it, you touch it, you feel it, you get excited. Um, and so in the sip and savor example on here is an example of how we're bringing that storytelling online, working with our visual merchandising team and of course our wonderful creative team. How do we tell that story that resonates with the customer and they can see, oh, I didn't know container store can, wait, build me a bar? Oh, and then I can buy this stuff to make my entertainment life efficient. Oh, and I can make it beautiful and all of those things. So that's what we're trying to uncover just to make sure that customers see the breadth of possibilities that we have in our in our assortment. If you go to the next slide, the next example is, this is such a hard one, but also interesting. How do we create those customer journeys? And to, you know, Michelle's point, like you don't wanna boil the ocean. It's really hard. You almost have to like take a slice and focus on that slice and nail that slice down. So in this example, I'll use our kitchen department or cook and entertain as an example, right? So maybe we have a new customer and the first thing that they buy is from our kitchen department and they buy bins, which we typically think those bins are gonna go in a pantry. Remember, the only signal we have is they bought something from the kitchen department and they bought these bins that we knew we know uh, are used to organize things in a pantry. How do we take that signal? Using all the other data, all the other behavior that we're seeing um, to kind of figure out the next best action, next best experience to put in front of the customer with a goal of let's drive the next purchase. If my goal is to drive the next purchase, that journey is very different. If my goal is to have them discover uh, an adjacent department, that journey is very different. So talking through what those goals are and having those customer journeys and those triggers really built out with the goal of enabling, enabling that, um, that outcome. And so that some of the data signals that we use obviously come from this, the, the transactional data, 
Um, we also have surveys. We also have data signals coming from the stores and what and what's resonating. How do we capture all of that data and and feed that into our systems and help drive the customer journey that we're looking for? Um, and then with this last example, I'm going to pivot and shift gears to our custom spaces. This one is uh, near and dear to my heart because this is sort of like my product baby since I've been at the container store today. Um, you know, when customers come to the container store looking for a custom spaces, their primary ways of interacting are they may walk into a store and talk to a designer. They may reach out online and schedule an appointment, whether it's in their home or again in the store and talk to somebody. Once they set that appointment and have a relationship built out, they might be emailing back and forth. They might be texting back and forth with the designer as they're trying to get this um, solution built out for them. Um, with this strategy, what we need to do and what we're doing is creating this end to end digital experience for custom spaces. Um, this involves creating efficient and delightful experiences for our associates, as well as for our customers so that it's all digitized and we have all the data and digital signals in one place. Um, and so I touched on earlier, um, Rich, when I mentioned CRM data, this is where CRM data is really important because we've got to know at what point in the customer journey are they? Are they still at the beginning stages where they're still kind of looking at inspiration and they still kind of don't know uh, what their next step is? Let's meet them there and get them inspired and help them move to the next step. Are they at the point where they have everything that they need and they need to make a purchase? What can we help them to kind of solve that friction point of, um, of the purchase? Um, installation day for us at the container store is like Christmas day. It's this thing that you've built out, you've imagined it, you've, you, you've worked with your designer, you, it's now happening. Installation day comes in, it's like almost Christmas day. So how do we treat that as special and eventful for that customer? And then the post experience is also really important because it's one to think about the solution in the space, but it's another thing to think about, okay, so how am I going to keep this organized? How am I going to make this space work for me as my life evolves? If it was a playroom, the playroom becomes a media room, media room becomes an office. How does that work for us? So keeping this all in a digital kind of framework and making sure that we're able to capture, you know, all of the signals and the data whether it's understanding interactions that they had with our designer, with our installers, with the store team, um, purchases that they made before the space, after the space, uh, during the design process, to kind of help us figure out, okay, where is the customer in the customer journey? Um, and, and making sure that we meet them to um, Christine's point at the right time with the right message and it's contextual. So that's, those are some three use cases. I hope those were helpful. Super great, thank you, Joyce. Um, yeah, let's talk, and, and actually, let's pull the pull our experts together. So, um, the challenges for the three companies we've talked about here are really, really vivid. I'd like to talk about the technology. You know, and Joyce, you had a nice slide there around the different kind of technologies that are getting deployed. But uh, would you maybe just lead off? You know, how do you? What is the most critical technology piece that you have on your radar now? And, 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 uh, you know, and I would say it's a 360 view of the customer and it's a combination of, of different technologies. So we have our CDP, which, you know, takes our loyalty. Info so let's say loyalty information. We have a loyalty customer data that gives us their profile name, address, and so forth. And then we have, um, where they are in their loyalty journey, how often they're purchasing with us or what spaces they have completed with us. And then we have our CDP, which takes all of that and using some of the technology that Epsilon enables provides added uh, profile data so we can understand this customer better from a segmentation perspective, from a um, income perspective, all of the data that you want to know about your customer. So I think for us, the most important thing for us to nail down is how do we define this 360 view of a customer? What are the key elements that we say is, is a 360 view of a customer? And then how do we use those key elements to then figure out what is the touch points, interactions, journeys that we need to engage with them on? So if I'm reading you right then, Joyce, you've got the CDP where you're collecting the data, but then you've got the tools, including Epsilon, that help enrich the data, pre-score all the records, you know, illuminate what segment is each person in, or uh, that uh, starts to illuminate where are they in their journey, 
where are they in their loyalty uh, status? So um, yeah, that enrichment, I could see how that would, that would might be the, 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 the uh, maker or breaker in terms of being able to actually activate some more in kind of uh, refined experiences. Mm -hmm. Am I reading it right? Or uh, am exactly I right? yes. And then add on to that transaction data because it goes back to yes. that, right? What is what is what what solution are we solving for them? How we solve for them? Are they interested in um, that we can keep, that can keep them as a brand as a brand customer for us? Yes, and so like Christ, Christina, you know, um, I think you're, you know in earlier you know, conversations you mentioned that there's a. Uh, CDP type technology in the picture in your work. Um, any comments or thoughts in terms yeah. of how this relates? So actually the, the CDP is scheduled to launch this month, which is fantastic and music to our ears because we really, just like Joyce said, need to really understand that 360 view and understand how we can really segment out these customers in, you know, in their purchase cycle, right? So, I mean, we have laps customers that haven't visited us in over a year, but then we have customers that come, you know, 3, 4 times a year. So how do we like figure out um, to get those customers to keep coming, sending them the right messages, sending them the right deal points from a CRM perspective, from a push notice perspective on your phone. Um, so there's a lot of great technology coming our way from the Pizza Hut standpoint. Um, we're also looking to update our app, which is. So exciting. That's hopefully going to happen in early 24. Um, and like I mentioned before, we really, from a media perspective, we really lean heavy into our MMM. So excited to see the CDP come to life. Super good. Um, Michelle, from your side, uh, when you think about, you know, and does this trigger any thoughts around, you know, just that uh, the technology challenge you're up against and the data challenge you're up against? Yeah, I was thinking as Joyce was speaking, I was thinking there's a lot, there are a lot of things that are analogous in the commercial construction space that there are in residential. Um, so I think looking at the technology and the data activation um, is an interesting opportunity. And again, I think, you know, being doesn't matter like B2C or B2B, the principles are the same. So there, given that we're early in the process of, of um, implementing, like designing and implementing communications platform, CX platform, I think it would be good, like more discussion could be had. I think there's a lot for, for us to learn from the consumer brands who are already, you know, farther along on that, you know, in their maturation in terms of execution. So um, that's kind of what's going through my head. More, more, more knowledge to take advantage of as we're going, as we're embarking on this process. All right. Well, I think we are seeing some questions and comments in the chat. Um, where, for the sake of time, I'm going to suggest we're going to do a, a, some summarization here and kind of talk about what's coming up next on Martechify, and then I think let's save Q and A till the very end. We can kind of open up the mic, so to speak, and go deeper uh, to the extent people are interested. Um, Laura, can we give it back to you at this point? Yes, we sure can. So um, if everybody would love to share some feedback, please do reach out to us. You can go to martechify.com to find us. And um, we have some events and things coming up here in the near future. If we could go to the next slide. Um, we have some firesides coming up on account-based marketing. Very excited about that, as well as pragmatic AI for right here, right now. Integrative analytics and platform tools tools is a forum, so that'll be next year. And um, as our plans update and some of these TBDs and to be announced things happen, you can check out what we're up to on LinkedIn by following us there and also by going to martechify.com. And with that, Rich, would you like me to unmute the participants or do you want to go into the questions in the chat? Uh, let me just make a quick comment and then I think we can kind of open up the mic. So if we can flash back up the upcoming events, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, we're very interested, the, the team, in hearing feedback around these topics. Uh, so, uh, for example, the next forum. So today's session is a forum. This would be the next larger session, just like we're doing today. Integrative analytics, platforms and tools, 
you know, the team's discussion is it seems like a natural kind of bridging from where we're leaving off today. But if you have comments or thoughts, uh, please pop them in the chat. We'd love to hear feedback. Uh, and or if there's something else that you think would be valuable, we're very, very open to suggestions. The firesides are going to be shorter format, kind of smaller, a little more bite-sized sessions. So um, account-based marketing is a is a rich subject to, you know, for B2B, you know, anybody doing B2B. Uh, and you can see the pragmatic AI for right here, right now. I'm excited about that one. Um, you know, there's so much shiny object syndrome going on around, you know, where might AI go in the future, but there's AI of tools available now. And we'd like to uh, uh, engender a conversation where we can look at the real tangible opportunities uh, right now. So, but we're interested in feedback. So please use the chat today, uh, pop your thoughts there. And, um, and then, like they said, come to the website uh, um, and uh, there's ways to uh, share feedback and also gather more information there. Let's do open up the mics. Uh, and uh, Laura, you may have some questions already kind of queued up from the chat. So let's let's talk a bit. Right. We do have several questions in the chat. Um, we had a couple from Andrea Gott. Um, Andrea would like to know more about personalization and using the data for personalization from, I believe it was from Joyce. Um, so any thoughts around that um, would be appreciated. And it's also personas, you know, personas and segment, you know, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think I'm reading the question about propensity and personas. So it's, it's, it's a tough one. We're doing a, a, some testing um, to be quite frank. So if, you know, we see, we see customers who shop this de department as a first department, typically they shop this next department next, or typically they shop this category first. And then they're moving to this category because that signals sort of like a life stage that they're in, um, in, in, in sort of like what they're looking for, solutions they're looking for. Um, and so we use some of that data. I'll tell you, it's still, we're, we're still very much in testing mode. So I am interested in looking forward to where this could go with AI and ML being a capability that's democratized across our platforms, where this could be something that we could just set and let run and let the system learn and figure out what the next thing to do. But right now we're doing a lot of test and learn in terms of how we figure out propensity or intent or next best action um, um, kind of scenarios. Interestingly, Joyce, we're doing some work around uh, patterns, pattern recognition and pattern interpretation. You know, what is the pattern of behavior that tells you you have uh, you know, at what point do you, do you say this person has lapsed? You know, they've kind of gone dark on us. At what point do you say, hmm, this person's an active shopper or uh, um, even simple stuff, but you can get more advanced and, and AI and ML will certainly play there. Yeah. Good deal. Did you have some more for us, Laura? I think we had one from Bruce who is also unmuted and he asked for situation intent. Do you integrate data signals from other platforms and other vendors? Yeah, and just to follow up, so it sounds as though Container Store is doing a great job of having their own unique world where customers go through a journey that's quite distinctive, um, maybe not predicted by other platforms. But I know there have been stories in the news about, um, you know, anticipating when somebody is getting to another life stage and getting the word out too soon. And I'm wondering if you've been out shopping for, um, Behavioral information that might come to you uh, from other platforms outside of Container Store. That's a good question. Um, so we do receive some data from from obviously our browsing data and working with some of our affiliates in terms of the cookies that they're able to track. And then uh, we do Epsilon as a platform does provide some of that world data that I think you kind of are alluding to, and that we use to pull into kind of enriching the customer data. However, I would say like using this data real time, we're still very much in testing mode, um, trying to make sure that we have the right signals because um, just because you browse something doesn't mean that it's you browsing, could be somebody using the same computer browsing that same thing. Um, and it's just that your session is still active. So 
they're just some things that we need to kind of look out for. But I would say like browsing data is the nearest and most easily one, easily accessible one to us. And then we have things like what they have on their save list, what um, what link affiliate links that clicked on that brought them to the website, and then um, recommendations or reviews or things that they're just looking at. We have some of that data that we are looking at. How we're using it is still in a very much test and learn kind of way. So in that test and learn um, environment that you're in, might that fit with Christine Redkin's question, how do you choose which behaviors are most impactful to capture the audience perspective and action? Um, I think that one popped in Joyce while you were talking, so I'll oh, answer okay. or maybe even Michelle. Yeah, I thought you said Christina, so I, was, I kept quiet because I thought it was a project oh, to Christina. No. Oh, I meant Christine Redkin. Okay. She, she's a participant. Yep. Yeah, I think it's just maybe repeating what I what I just mentioned earlier. It's um, we we are not yet in the place where we have some automated system that's working through all of this, and so we're building out our journey maps very intentionally based on the signals and the data that we have right now um, to drive that behavior. In a lot of it is test and learn, um, and as soon as we get uh, information, we you know we'll probably. Next, take that to the next level. So I'm really looking for this next uh, phase of AI and ML um, that's going to help us unlock some of this testing that we've been doing and learning with our customer base. Thank you, Joyce. And I think that's it for the questions. Are there any other questions that participants would like to post in the chat or unmute? Again, raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted. We have one from Pam Fleming, support from field sales or a regional location is so important. How to get buy-in? Uh, maybe we, we might go with Michelle or Christine on that. Would someone like to take that one? Yeah, I mean, we can take that from a Pizza Hut standpoint. So, you know, we are a, a national brand, but it, it is important to understand that uh, we are a franchisee built company. So. Um, we we definitely need the the buy-in from our, our local partners, our local our local um, board and committees to make sure that we are all on the same page. And um, but yeah, so it's definitely important to get them to to buy in to make sure that everyone's across, especially as we roll into specific price points. There's definitely issues in the West Coast markets where uh, they have a very um, high wage um and so the amount that we charge for pizza has to to met, match that as well so we can't give away pizza for free um so it's definitely a challenge to make sure that we're aligned from a national standpoint with so many different needs across different DNA, dmas geographies um, and makeups of the country All right, very good. Well, I think let's go ahead and wrap. Uh, thank you again, Joyce, Michelle, and Christina. Fantastic insights today. Um, and thanks to everybody who participated. Um, really, uh, really good to have the group together today. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us, Rich. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you.